Hello, everyone. Uh, today includes Avinar. Durbar will present. He's from IISC. He just completed his PhD from the Department of Mechanical Engineering. And today he'll talk about impact phenomena in liquid interfacial systems across spatiotemporal scales. So without further ado, over to you, Durbar. Thank you, everyone, uh, for joining. And uh, good afternoon. And I will first uh, want to thank ICTS for uh, giving me the opportunity to present a seminar. And I also want to thank Sama Govindraja to uh, invite me to do this talk, actually. Uh, I hope my audio is clear, correct? Like, like sound? OK, good. Yeah, it's clear. Yeah, great. So what I will uh, today I will discuss and talk about is my uh, what I generally did during my PhD uh, research and what I studied mainly was impact phenomena in interfacial systems. So I generally studied how let's say colliding uh, objects uh, um, interact with each other, where one of the phases is either a liquid or both can be liquid or one can be gaseous and liquid. So that is the major theme in which we are working on. So we are mainly interested in, let's say, systems in which you have uh, some kind of uh, impact. Uh, so kinetic energy, that's the main thing. Like you have kinetic energy in the system and the kinetic energy is somehow playing a role and that interacts with uh, the, the most important component for, let's say, interfacial system, which is surface tension, actually. So the, the major part of this thing, we will see basically a kind of... Uh, uh, interplay or a balance between uh, kinetic energy and surface tension, basically. Okay, so uh, the rough outline of my talk is I will start with the basic motivation. Put an IE photo there, like what's the impact in an IE? Uh, yeah, so, okay. so uh, what this thing was, the, these three are one, like, one of the key uh, images that uh, was the part of my actually PhD research. So this is one of the phenomena uh, that we, that occurs actually, and this phenomena is what is known as non-contact tonometry. So what happens is anyone who has a specs or who goes to an ophthalmologist and he does an eye test, one of the key of their um, test is basically intraocular pressure measurement. So what they do is they check what is the pressure that is there inside our, uh, like uh, in the aqueous humor basically. So our eye has different fluids in it. Aqueous humor, one of the key outer layers. And what it does is like it, it provides a coating and it has several nutrients, basically. So what happens is there is a constant flow in of that aqueous humor that has been produced uh, by different parts. And I will discuss how it, the mechanism happens later. But so this kind of mechanisms are uh, key, or I will say very important in understanding, let's say, uh, atomization problems, let's say, from uh, systems in which even we cannot imagine. Like when I first encountered this problem, I myself was so surprised because I never thought in this line itself. So although I don't have specs myself, so I don't have, but I asked my friends and they, they always say that, okay, and we're good, when you go to a doctor's clinic, you put your chin on a chin wrist basically, and they measure your pressure basically, correct? Something happens to your eye, but you, and, and so basically a part of my PhD problem was to understand what that process is actually, how that, that thing occurs in depth because literature is next to negligible on that, the experimental side of things basically. And so wanted to relate our understanding of current fluid mechanics thing on that, that problem. So that's the context of this I actually. So uh, these other two things are also like, I will just uh, highlight is basically, uh, this is a system when which you have a drop that is impacting an immiscible pool, pool of liquid. And you see what, what are known as the uh, surface craters that come inside the droplet. And we also study those things. And that last image that we have is basically is imagine that you have a liquid drop and that liquid drop is basically coming and it's impacting some surface. Okay. And what we are doing is we are doing a bottom view interferometry visualization of the drainage mechanism that occurs when the surface that is coming and just tries to contact the surface basically. So we want to understand that. So that is an image that is related to that. Yeah, so, uh, so I will first uh, talk a basic about the motivation, then a little bit about uh, like Im impact phenomena in specifically what I did, I worked on. And then I will work on two major problems that I will discuss in today's meeting that were, that is about non-contact tonometry and in the context of pathogen transmission. Why pathogen transmission? Because this problem was thought in a time during COVID actually. This COVID, uh, there is this uh, group in uh, Bangalore, Narayan and Netrala, I think so people will be familiar. So they uh, like came up with this idea actually and the problem in the, in the first place. 
because they were concerned like uh, during covid time what was the con major concern that transmission is to occur through aerosols basically the aerosol mechanism basically like you sneeze you cough uh, talk a lot of things so the major transmission mode was there but that time ophthalmologists were also uh, they were in a, they didn't understand that although this mode was a non contact which i will explain why it is non contact but this still has some kind of a propensity towards different kinds of pathogen transmission so that is the non contact tonometry and the the final problem that i will discuss is uh, drop impacts on different solids and uh, immiscible liquid systems basically um, I, in the first i will say that non contact tonometry that that problem is more from an applied perspective so where there will see more engineering and more experimental thing and the impact problem was more done in little bit more in uh, experimental as well as theoretical research basically more into detail so that will have more of theoretical flavor as well as experiments but uh, that is more uh, related to applied so where we want to test some uh, hypothesis that was already been established in the community and we wanted to uh, understand and visualize those mechanisms so the overall motivation to study impact processes is like for example you can think about spray cooling systems you can think about raindrop impacts erosion one of the very important thing when you have drop impacts on surfaces that leads to erosion inkjet printing uh, spray painting medical diagnostics and this is the thing i am talking about so that medical diagnostics is what the non contact tonometry that we will be talking about in forensic science like in where uh, drop impact surfaces and we have different kinds of blood splatter and doing blood splatter analysis helps us to reconstruct the crime scene actually what was there in initially what happened what led to the different series of events to understand a particular uh, uh, i will say a crime scene case Uh, impact phenomenon is also established like in very very large scale systems specifically to different kinds of extinction and creation events like for example um, it's like believed and known by uh, scientists basically that um, dinosaurs were extinct due to such uh, one sort uh, impact processes basically that created the ejecta sheet that you can see and another motivation basically to study impact phenomena is a very very stark resemblance between basically between drop impacts and you can see these kind of impact events so the sheet that comes out it has a very very inherent geometric and kinematic similarity uh, that drives all this phenomena so uh, concepts and i will say uh, mechanisms in one can lead to an understanding of the other and vice versa so that's why it's a very i will say a, a good way to study and we can uh, understand both the phenomena in a much deeper way uh, so th this is the, i will say the basic mechanics that we will be looking at in this thing so we will be looking at non contact tonometry look 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 at different kinds of drop impact phenomena for example drop impact on different surfaces it could be solid surface it could be liquid surface it could be even bio inspired surfaces bio inspired surfaces for example you can think about surfaces that was mimicked by getting inspiration from nature actually so for example you can have systems like you know um, rose petal correct you know lotus leaves there the the surface is very slippery so if you put a drop basically there the drop sits on a very different way versus how it will sit let's say on a, uh, a normal clean glass slide basically so basically the wettability properties are totally different and those wettability properties are not chemical in nature Th those are actually topological and morphological in nature that means they can be created in a lab setting and hence can be studied uh, in a in a better way so that that is uh, when we study drop impacts on bio inspired surfaces on immiscible liquids so basically you can think about a system when you have a water drop it's impinging a liquid liquid media and we are interested in the problem again on the drainage thing that exists right at the interface between the impinging drop and the surface basically okay so how how that uh, the air that is entrapped because one thing you need to understand whenever we have this impact phenomena like for proper contact to happen all the inter like i will say the matter that is present between the two bodies has to be completely eliminated to establish the first point of contact and one of the key things that we established in this research is basically to identify what is that key point of contact and how how what is that key and what are the different mechanisms that leads to it normally if we see a drop impacting a surface from normal intuition and from side view visualization it it seems that we have a normal drop impacts but most often in nature what we have is although the impact is totally normal the first point of rupture is never normal it happens axisymmetric as you can see here this so and i will talk more about what those things are and how uh, those are related to so first i will uh, start by uh, discussing uh, non contact tonometry in the context of pathogen transmission as i said before so to understand what is uh, 
non contact convective we need to first understand what is tonometry so this is the uh, the section anatomy of our human eye and like human eye is quite complicated it's one of the i will say the second most complicated other than our human brain actually it's very complicated and and there are different uh, i will say um, materials and different mechanisms that are involved in uh, controlling all the different processes that leads to our normal vision actually so the most important thing i would like to focus your attention is basically this anterior chamber where actually the aqueous humor is stored actually okay and this aqueous humor is a fluid that is being generated by cells and tissues that are presented in this these are known as ciliary bodies so what happens is this these are secreted from the ciliary bodies it goes through this can you see this blue layer this blue layer is basically the pathway in which the aqueous humor flows and it, it enters the anterior chamber in the first place so that is the inflow mechanism of that aqueous humor basically so you think that, that is some kind of a volume in which some amount of liquid is going into that that thing and there is similarly an outflow mechanism and that outflow mechanism is related to the, this is what is known as the canal of sclem or the sclem canal where the the what, whatever is generated let's say whatever is required the remaining uh, aqueous humor gets drained from that region basically so again you have a balance now so you see something is entering and something is leaving and hence there is a build up of pressure uh that exists there basically and for there the, is yeah. this membrane the black thing in front right this one ah yeah so everything between the lens and the membrane is the anterior chamber yeah so so you can think like the everything between this iris so you have the iris ah everything between the iris and the cornea is the anterior chamber okay cornea. then what is that gray part which you didn't color which one this one no just next this one? yeah above above the gray ah. light gray just outside the black this thing. one i couldn't get there so is there fluid here also that's what i'm asking yes exactly in this cavity ah uh. this cavity so this cavity this cavity is so this is the cornea as you can see uh. this is the cornea okay? okay and this is the outer part so inside this is what we want to measure the pressure basically okay so that is the pressure measurement there is what is referred to as the iop the intraocular pressure and controlling that is very important for our ocular health because let's say in some cases what can happen is darba sorry uh, 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 because the pointer is not visible online can you just mention which area that remain you are talking about i mean there are several names so you can sort of mention the yeah. uh, okay sure uh, i can see the mouse yeah. uh so for for example what i was talking about is for example like you can think this as your cornea okay if this is your cornea and the fluid that what we were talking about is the aqueous humor fluid basically and that is uh, present in this section and the pressure that we are talking and the pressure measurement in which the intraocular pressure works actually is in this region basically okay okay am i clear on that sure thank you okay so what we want to understand is basically why this iop is important and this iop is important because it can lead to different uh, i will say um like you said medical conditions for example glaucoma being one of the key condition in which that can lead to permanent blindness also that is related to high increase in that ocular pressure basically okay so uh, like this is what again i can see a sectional view of that and here i am just showing basically the key uh, like um, the fluid fluid components so for example you have the vitreous humor basically which is not the major focus the major focus is basically this blue area and that is where the aqueous humor is there and this aqueous humor is being secreted by the ciliary muscles and the ciliary bodies that is presented present here and it comes out of the uh, of a section basically here the sclem canal and how this balance is maintained is basically between a, it's a inflow mechanism and an outflow mechanism and the balance between both is what controls the intraocular pressure basically and yeah, as you can see this fluid mechanics problem that we are looking at is basically there are different kind of things that under that that, that is present inside our human eye so we have the vitreous uh, we, we have the vitreous humor we have the aqueous humor and we have the tear film and we will see the tear why the tear film is important and the, the role of tear film basically in terms of uh, um, pathogen transmission basically so intraocular pressure is given by this equation basically which again it's a balance uh, of the inflow and the outflow mechanisms and this pv is basically the venous local venous pressure that is there inside our human eye and that adds to additional uh, contribution to the uh, to, to the pressure head basically and another important thing to mention is this intraocular pressure is measured relative to the atmospheric pressure so that's a gauge pressure measurement basically so it's a delta p that we are talking about so we think about so so we want to measure uh, pressure in human eye 
And previously, what people used to do is they used to measure uh, pressure when the technology was not that developed by normal human hand, basically. So doctors used to take their fingers and they used to press in the eye to check. And that was very scary, toxic, and things like that. So that led to the development of a more methodological way, which is known as Goldman tonometer. That was also a contact tonometer. But again, that was also scary because somebody will point a piece of metal embedded into your eye and hence measure the corresponding pressure. Further uh, like um, improvement in technologies in medical devices led to this development in uh, non-contact tonometry in which what happens is we have a nozzle air and what it generates, it generates a puff of air. And this puff of air actually travels towards this cornea and it interacts with the, uh, our outer surface of the cornea. And depending on the pressure, basically, it deflects the cornea. Basically. And the deflection is measured by optical sensors that are present in the head of this tonometer. And that is calibrated to the reference pressure. So that's the pressure measurement mechanism of a non-contact tonometer. Okay. What was done in 1991 by this group, uh, Britt et al., they found for the first time uh, that there can be a chance of micro aerosol formation in those uh, in these kind of systems. But that time, the digital technology was not that great, basically. So we didn't have high quality and high resolution images to understand the time resolved, uh, I will say, mechanism of those things that are coming out. So what we did was we wanted to understand that thing much better using high speed imaging technology. So this is uh, what I will say is our uh, setup. It's, it's, uh, it's simple, where you have a uh, lab operator and you have a patient who wants to measure and then you want to image the region between the eye and the tonometer nozzle, basically. So what happens is the tonometer nozzle is kept right in front. It's uh, roughly approximately of the order of, I will say, 11 uh, uh, mm apart. So it's quite close, but not touching your eye. Okay, And you need to measure in that region. And this is what the experiments that we did in IIC during the COVID time, actually, so in collaboration with uh, Narayan and Nitrala. And, uh, and we ourselves, as well as the doctors from Narayan and Nitrala, were the volunteers that were involved in doing these experiments, basically. And uh, another important thing was the visualization was challenging because we are dealing with actual real human subjects. So that is the key challenge in which the measurement processes and the corresponding lighting conditions becomes very, very intense because you need to understand uh, we have our chin rest and that has been attached very close to a very, very high intensity light source. So what it does is it creates a burn condition into your face. And so the, the experiments was challenging from that perspective, basically, that because we are dealing with a human element. Okay, so what I will suggest is like, this is a video I will show and uh, this will explain in brief the mechanism that I was talking in general and what we have observed. You had volunteers yes, from Naren and Etralia, patients from Naren and Etralia who volunteered to come to IAC for this. Uh, not just patients, uh, but doctors, doctors, themselves. Doctors, doctors themselves and we ourselves. Like, right, that from... part I got. But you actually had in addition patients. Additional patients in the sense like from their, like they, right. they, they have arranged for that. Actually. Okay. Yeah, so I will play this video and this, I like, yeah. What is there now? Yeah, it will come. So all the parts will be explained in detail in detail on this video itself, as well as I will be describing each of these mechanisms in more detail. So what you can see is basically the, how the, the vortex is basically coming and interacting, and we had different kinds of obstacles there to measure those. So this is the main structure of the air pump that comes out. And this is what interacts with the human cornea, basically, to measure the corresponding pressures. And when this hits our eye, the cornea eye, it generates basically sheets that comes out of that. And that is the thing that we were concerned about. Uh, 
uh, like it's not painful in that sense because it happens at a very fast time scale actually. Yeah. Yeah, only the light is a bit of a problem. It's really bright and it seems to be shining in the eye. And, and this we did with different kinds of eye samples. For example, we also did the experiments with goat eyes because goat eyes are biologically very, very, that mimics our human eye very, very accurately in terms of the pressure as well as the geometry. Basically. So that was the corresponding thing. So what- we actually yeah. kept a living goat there. Not living goat there. The eye, we take the eye the, from the butcher's shop actually. We take the eyes actually, and we connect those to corresponding hydrostatic heads to create the corresponding pressure inside that eye. And then do this so experiment, create, create that pressure. pressure basically for the goat eyes. And for the live eyes, we like we have our own mechanism. Basically. So you can see the different kind of mechanisms and of uh, fragmentations and uh, drop formations basically. And that is that was the thing that was too concerned towards the ophthalmologist that although this being a non-contact process, but you see this leads to a transmission, which is like, it can fall to a surface. It can form fomites, it can form aerosols, and we have a distribution basically uh, for the different processes basically. So you're worrying about infections coming from that? Yes, you're, you're worrying, the, the doctors were worried about the infections that, that could be transmitted through that mechanism. And we wanted to understand more about the mechanisms that why it comes in the first place and what are the, the okay. so in this summary, so you can see these are the major phases that we were able to identify. So we have the initial air puff ejection and then, then uh, we have this initial sheet expansion. Then we have the corneal deflection that leads to corresponding capillary waves that interacts with the tear film, which is present inside our eye. And that leads to the corresponding sheet, the sheet ejection and the sheet fragmentation. And there are different kinds of unstable waves that travel on top of that. Uh, Rayleigh Taylor, for example, the like Kelvin Helmholtz, and that finally leads to ligament kind of breakup, which are the plateau relay kind of breakup that we have observed. Okay, so this is the the major summary that I was talking about, and uh, like we were able to classify the, the time scales basically of this all the, all the mechanisms in a very very I will say with the capillary capillary time scale. So as you can see, TC is a capillary time scale that was normalized with respect to uh, with respect to all the dimensional time scale that we had in our system basically. So we normalized that with respect to the capillary time scale and we were able to characterize all this in a manner so that they can correlate in time basically. So what led to what? R is what like the radius of the eye? R is a dim typical dimensions of the cornea basically. Uh -huh. Cornea, yeah. And sigma is surface tension. Surface tension. So how much is TC? Uh, TC is roughly of the order of like, what I will say, uh, about a 30th, 30 milliseconds roughly of that order basically. So this is the structure of the air puff that, that we have and we were able to classify and measure this actually. So what, do we, what do you see is basically this jet that travels towards our human eye and it interacts with the corneal surface and that causes a deformation. And this is the jet characteristics basically. So it has a corresponding speed roughly of the order of five meters per second. So it varies actually because uh, it's being, it's a transient mechanism. So, so it's not steady at five meters per second, but that's the roughly the mean on which it, it works. So, so the, the sheet, the initial sheet mechanism we can understand. It's like yeah. it will be uh, not a continuous vortex, right? No. Vortices so, we, so coming at yes, some so number. absolutely. So, so for, for, but it's not a continuous vortex. So it's basically a single leading vortex followed by a trailing jet, basically. So we have a jet attached to a leading vortex that travels to a Okay, eye. so after the first leading vortex, there are no further vortices. There are no further vortices. So you so, wait for that to get over or the, you, the leading itself? Heating vortex is important for you. Uh, so, so what we see is the initial sheet formation mechanism that is uh, attached to the, the leading vortex. On the other hand, the deformation of the eye that is related to the trailing jet, basically, the pressure that is coming due to the trailing jet, actually. So, isn't it just simple if I shut my eye till the leading vortex goes away? Uh, I couldn't understand your question. I'll keep my eyes closed yes. and the leading vortex will go away. Yeah. And then I'll open and you measure the pressure. No, but like again, it, like it is happening, our that response time scale is very, very large actually, in which this measurement has to happen actually. Correct? Because, like, for example, if I close my eyelid uh, and we have the vortex coming in, then uh, the deformation, the skin will absorb quite a bit of the eyelid will absorb quite a bit of energy actually. And that will not lead to proper deformation of the cornea actually. Because what, what I'm saying, you just keep the puff coming. So puff is on, you're saying. Puff is on. Okay. So initially I've got my eyes closed. Hmm. 
then the leading vortex is gone then i open and you measure no but again that that is the response time scale of a human then correct like like that that cannot be standardized in that sense correct to for for a proper pressure measurement no after that it should reach a steady state no once i keep it open uh, like for example if you have a puff so how the measurement works is i'm saying don't keep a puff key just keep a continuous jet so okay if you have a continuous jet basically coming that will so that will have a constant deformation in your eye basically for a very long time and then that can be painful process okay. what we want is the process to be as less painful as possible and hence the pressure measure the processes has to be very very fast okay. for example if you have a very high uh, focus jet imp impinging that can lead to quite a bit of pain basically and that's not a standardized uh, medical process yeah so uh, like so, so this is the initial sheet expansion mechanism that we want to discuss actually so what happens is this we saw basically before that the jet was expanding so as it was coming towards it was expanding so it had some kind of a transverse velocity and that transverse velocity was scaled in a manner that was related to the initial expansion rate of the sheet basically and that is this graph that we, that we are able to understand and this could be understand based on this conservation of mass of that initial sheet dimension basically that we were able to establish from this and this we did on a lot of different kinds of objects not on just i will say human eye but different kinds of uh, substrates where we had a solid substrate or a solid shaped eye and we saw similar kind of expansion mechanism so this expansion mechanism is by the way happening at a rate which is quicker than the deformation of the cornea so this is happening before the ocular pressure measurement is taking place so this is the thing because this is coming first and then the vortex comes and hits uh, the, the jet comes and hits so this is the, the second phase in which what you see is the deformation phase the entire deformation history of the cornea basically so like initially you can see this this is some kind of um, uh, natural response uh, like some kind of an harmonic response you can think of with that corresponding rigidity to the cornea basically so we have a corresponding rigidity to the cornea and you have some kind of loading that that is occurring and then it relaxes up to a particular time scale you can think about like a spring mass damper system we can model the corresponding mechanics of this we also oh, yeah yeah i just want to see the time T by TC and TC is it's the capillary time scale that we discussed is before. How many milliseconds? That is roughly of the order of 30 milliseconds. 30 milliseconds. Yes. So this is again 30 milliseconds. Yeah. The displacement. No, the so yeah, this is two, like two in that sense, like twice of that. No, no, the maximum is yeah. around. Is that around is a one. Yeah, 30. Yeah, maximum is one. So somehow the response time of the elastic sheet is also similar. Yes. Okay. okay. So, uh, what we saw was when this when the next the jet part comes and interacts with the eye what happens is it leads to this kind of capillary waves that travels on the surface of the eye actually this was also very very new because this kind of a capillary wave measurements on the corneal surface was not was, was not present basically so and this could be again characterized by the corresponding dispersion relation and the group velocity so you can see this is the uh, the, the the velocity and the corresponding characteristics wave number and that wave number is basically the distance between the corresponding waves and troughs, basically, of the uh, tra traveling capillary waves. And that falls on that curve, basically. So the measurements that we were doing was on, it, it was falling on that curve, basically. This is, again, the capillary wave in a much more closer view. And the top one is what we are seeing. This top one is actually human eye. And this bottom one is actually the cadaver goat eye, actually, as you can see. Those, so you can see the deformation because the down one we have, Purposefully, in that case, the image that is being showed here, the pressure has been lowered quite a bit, as you can see. And hence, you can see the deformation is very, very high. On the other hand, you can see the deformation to the cornea is not that. that. In the previous slide, if you see, the corresponding deformation is roughly of the order of 0.8 millimeters of that scale. On the other hand, so, but that is related to the actual pressure that exists inside our human eye. If that pressure is not very, very, I will say, um, properly balanced, then we can have extreme deformation. So let's say if your pressure is very, very down, our eye can have a huge deformation, basically. So the sheets, the, the, just we talked about that, the initial sheet that came out, basically, that lead to the corresponding, uh, uh, the sheet coming out of the eye, and that forms different kind of unstable waves. And these unstable waves then fragmented 
and led to different kinds. So, so this could be modeled and this could be understood based on the general uh, Rayleigh Taylor dispersion mechanism, basically. So because one thing we need to understand is this is not traditional Rayleigh Taylor. This is to be thought about uh, Rayleigh Taylor and Kelvin Helmholtz in an accelerated uh, sheet mechanism, basically. So, you, so it's not like the uh, fluid that we are looking is at still. So it's like you need to uh, be in a reference frame in which the sheet is stationary, which is itself accelerating and decelerating, and hence the corresponding waves th that appear, basically. So here, for example, here the G effective, that G effective is basically taking into account the gravitational as well as that acceleration uh, term of that sheet, basically. And we, we did the corresponding measurements. We did the corresponding time scale growthlets as well as the fastest growing wave. And here you can see that for the wave, wave characteristics, our uh, uh, predictions and the measurements were very, very close actually. You can see the peak converging towards. On the other hand, our temporal measurements were off, like on the sense. You can see that means we were not able to capture the temporal measurements that uh, properly because what we happened is maybe there was a delay in our initial uh, triggering actually that led to this kind of a temporal mismatch. But what you can see is there is a peak actually, and that peak is uh, close by. And that, that uh, presence of those two peaks nearby actually is, is the signature. And, but the order of magnitude is same actually. That is the key thing to be realized. And that order of magnitude is coming from the corresponding uh, dispersion relation just we discussed before. Uh, this leads to the later part of the me mechanism where you have the sheet and the sheet again then going into the breakup mode basically. And then what happens is the sheet uh, forms these kind of ligament-like structures and this follows the standard Rayleigh Plato kind of breakup modes basically. Uh, and like again, we did different kind of here drop sizes and drop speed measurement. And this was what was uh, actually the outcome that the doctors wanted basically, because they wanted to know what is the size distribution of the drops and what are the speeds in which they travel. So you can see that we have a kind of, kind of a continuous deformation uh, or like a distribution in the lower end of the spectrum. So we didn't generate droplets much larger than three millimeters. So we didn't uh, generate droplets of much big scales. Okay. Can we measure the size distribution? Like what we had, camera. yes, like we had high speed cameras at different orientations, actually different angles and different orientations and taking instantaneous images at different planes, we were able to uh, generate, I will see a database over which the statistics was done actually. Yeah. Taking does not happen. Like uh, slow, if you, Speed out a slope of. Mm -hmm. Is there a time where this breakage does not happen? Like, like what you are saying is, if the uh, impinging uh, velocity is not that high, yeah, correct. So yeah, so what what can lead to is if the if your leading vortex is not created, because what is important is in this kind of scenario when you have an orifice opening and some jet is coming out, the the formation of that leading vortex is very much dependent on that initial. Uh, uh, velocity and the pressure that generates that thing. So if you have a very, very low speed jet, the amount of that leading vortex that forms is on a different scale, actually. So that can lead to a different kind of mechanisms altogether, like different kind of structure of the initial uh, vortex that comes out. Okay. And the initial, uh, hence the initial sheet mechanism characteristics can be different. On the other hand, there will be a direct correlation to the pressure that you can measure. Because if you have a low speed, you will not be able to measure very, very high pressure ranges, basically. You can measure only a very narrow spectrum of uh, pressure range, basically. So that, that was the main thing what we were able to show, that we have a kind of a distribution of droplets at different speeds and uh, size scales, basically. And these were what the doctors were actually worried about, actually. And, and they wanted to know, OK, that means there are some things that are being produced, actually. And then the mechanisms that they wanted to think about is, the, so our eye, our nose, and our throat are all linked. We have this nasolacrimal junction that we have actually. So let's say pathogens and viruses which are present, let's say in one component of our system can, can traverse to the other parts of the system basically. So for example, if your throat is infected, you can feel it in your nose or your nose infected, you can similarly for all the three uh, phases. So that's why there was a concern in the medical community in that sense. And, and this was the first kind of measurements in that uh, range of spectrum where we were able to give them quantifiable data actually. Uh, so that in which they were able to prepare a protocol for measurement purposes. So next time onwards, during COVID, what they did was they were able to uh, design some kind of a chamber in which this mechanisms was done. Like previously it was done openly, like without any kind of a thing. Because, but since it was shown that there is a propensity to generate these kind of uh, jets at, or this kind of droplets, 
so they wanted to do it in a much more confined setting so that they don't want to like accidentally infect uh, i will say a, a, a person or let's say some surface uh, unknowingly basically because this is not known actually in the community that is the key thing that is being uh, targeted in this research basically that was that so that was the first part of this talk actually where we were talking about this in which uh, we wanted to understand the the mechanics that occurs and basically the fluid mechanics that occurs and that leads to different drops formation mechanisms. So, is yeah. Number enough to cross disease. Like, I couldn't understand you. The number of droplets per eye, like, enough to cause disease. Uh, so, uh, so, the important thing here is the pathogen loading, actually. So, right. so again, so let's say if your drops. Like, is, for example, if I compare it to a sneeze or something, mm -hmm. is it equal so, to that? Yeah, like given the distribution that we, we are able to see actually, if you see the lower expand, that means it can aerosolize. Yeah. So if it aerosolizes, that means it can stay in the system and hence it can lead to infections. On the other hand, let's say larger droplets, larger droplets, we can have high density pathogens, like you have more number of concentrations of pathogen and that forms, but they will not aerosolize fast, like because their evaporation time scales are much larger basically. So they will form projectile kind of trajectory and they will fall on some surface. They will form what are known as fomites actually. And those have different kind of transmission uh, um, mechanisms. So that was the first part. So before moving, I just wanted to know any questions from that side of things. Uh, from the online, if anybody wants to ask anything. Okay. So uh, I think so then we'll move on to the next part in which we what, what we'll talk about is basically drop impacts. And uh, this was, uh, uh, and we will talk about drop impacts on different kinds of solids and different kinds of uh, immiscible systems. That, that, because miscible system drop impacts, there are a lot of literature actually. Drop impact literature on miscible systems started roughly about 150 to 200 years back actually, from the first work by Worthington actually. Worthington, and this is the famous that Worthington jet that you see in lots of advertisement where you have a drop coming and you have a jet that comes out, correct? That's the infamous, very, very well known Worthington jet. And he was the first person who started this phase of research, the drop impact research that, that we are still doing now. But uh, again, the, um, the research in drop impact became better in the last 10 decades, which is because of very, very high speed imaging quality that we have nowadays, because we are able to resolve scales at much faster uh, time scales. So again, like, so, uh, so, so think about like what we are seeing is ev events, let's say a drop, which is impacting and uh, let's say surface. So this is like a PDMS surface and you see different kinds of jetting mechanism that can come out of the surfaces, correct? So these are interesting again, because this leads to different kind of, uh, like you saw that the drops coming down, it, the, the capillary waves traveling, they're coalescing and they form to these drops. So can we do something? Let's say we can engineer these surfaces so that these kind of mechanisms can be avoided. Let's say we want some application in which we don't want that jet to come out. So for example, so, uh, taking uh, inspiration from nature. So we have the uh, rose and the lotus leaves, correct? They have different microstructures in them, basically. So different kinds of microstructure arrangements in them. And these are roughly of the order of micron level. So this uh, rose is roughly of the five micron and lotus is roughly of the order of 14 to 15 microns. So the so what, what happens is we want to understand when drop impacts these surfaces, what happens actually, okay? Because uh, the initial spreading part of the drop impact. So the, there are different phases of drop impacts. So when drop impacts the surface, we have the spreading phase where it is mainly driven by the initial kinetic energy of the system. It's been and been retarded by the corresponding I will say, surface tension and the dissipation that occurs at the contact lines. And on the other hand, this is what happens in traditional wettable surfaces. On the other hand, let's say if you have a non-wettable surface, for example, lotus. So lotus is an example of a non-wettable surface in which you have these micro pillared kind of arrangements. So what happens is now the drop is coming and impinging on a very, very thin cushion of lay air actually. So there is no direct contact between the drop and the surface. So the dissipation that occurs, let's say in very, very flat or let's say very, very smooth surfaces is prevented in, in by, corru by corrugation. So this is like a, like normal intuition says that, okay, if you corrugate some surfaces, like it will be worse basically. But for some cases at these scales actually, because what the drop is doing is basically it's skating over an air, air layer. Basically. Okay. So that is what we wanted to understand actually. So how do we create these surfaces? So these surfaces are created using techniques known as uh, lithography methods. So what you have is basically you have a PDMS substrate. So that's a very, a PDMS is a very good material in which what you can do is you can uh, put a stamp and you can embed them and it can 
uh, reform that structure for a very long time, actually. And it can be heat treated and it could be chemically treated, actually. So, for example, you can see here, like the, uh, the PDMS layer, it, and, like we can change the viscoelastic properties by heating it at different rates, at different places, let's say. So we can create regions of uh, different viscoelastic properties. And let's say then you embed a stamp or let's say some kind of uh, uh, layer on, on the PDMS. So what we will have, the deformations will be different at different uh, places. And hence you will see, we have a textured surfaces, which is not uniform. So you can engineer those things basically. That is what the lithography process is all about. So you see, like, for example, if you have like drop impacts on Lotus and Rose, just now what we saw in PDM is the same thing we are seeing in Lowe's. And you see that the, the jet formation was prevented. You don't see that jet coming out, you can see, because that is very, very closely related to the contact line dynamics that occurs at the edge of the drop, basically. And again, that is related to the air layer that sits just beneath the point of, like, uh, between the impinging drop and the surface. Basically. So you can see, like, here the mechanisms, although the initial kinetic energy is the same, uh, every, the base substrate is the same, but you see the outcome is different, as you can see. And another thing you can observe, there is a difference in the kind of, uh, like the, I will say the, uh, the later phase of this. So, so lotus substrate, you can see, it, it forms a very different kind. On the other hand, you see the rose, it doesn't do that kind of a lift off, basically. Again, that is also related to the corresponding air layer dynamics that occurs beneath the surfaces, basically. So this gives us a very important motivation to study and understand the air layer dynamics that occurs and control it in an engineering way so that we were able to tune certain processes in an efficient manner as possible, depending on the technology. For example, in certain cases, we want the jet in which we can tune it accordingly. In some cases, we don't want the jet. So that is about engineering uh, surfaces in a um, way in which we take inspiration from nature and we can come up with me methods uh, like these. So you can see like different kinds of classifications uh, we can create basically uh, in, in terms of different impact energies. And as I said, like before that, this Weber number is a very important parameter in all impact studies because that is the term that uh, decides the ratio of the kinetic energy of impact and the corresponding basically, uh, uh, I will say the surface tension basically, which is trying to prevent uh, any kind of like uh, i will say change in area basically the change in surface area on the other hand the kinetic energy is trying to spread it as much equally as possible basically. So that's a clear balance and weber number is a very important and key parameter basically in drop impact studies where the role of air is very very important on the other hand let's say if you are dealing with systems in which uh, uh, that uh, the air layer is not that important then we have to bring the ad additional parameter, which is the Reynolds number, because then we need to bring in the dissipation also that occurs uh, between the surfaces. But since we are dealing with the system that is, uh, I will say, coming down and hitting a surface and skating on surfaces, basically, it's like basically floating on surfaces. Weber number is a central key parameter of interest, basically. So uh, we can understand these kind of mechanisms based on uh, clear balances of um, continuity equations. Uh, um, mass and momentum equation. So we can come up with various kinds of maximum spreading rates and, and receding rates, basically. And we can do all different kinds of measurements related to droplet receding, droplet, uh, whatever is the maximum size for a given kinetic energy that it can leave. And we, we were able to generate scales like this. As you can see, like the maximum spread is related to one fourth power of Weber number, Th that thing. And how you see, we are able to capture the contact angle that comes into the picture. So there where the engineering comes into the picture. So different wettable surfaces will have different contact angles and that leads to different kind of uh, spread, spread rates basically. So while we come in to understand this uh, important thing, you see the important thing here is this retardation scale actually. And that retardation scale roughly is the impact velocity square divided by the drop length scale. And that is much, much greater than the gravity, basically. So gravity, you can neglect in these kinds of scenarios. Hence, for in droplet sense, because we are talking at time scales, which are of the order of milliseconds. And for if you want to understand uh, the air layer, which is between, we are talking even faster times, because we are talking about microseconds, actually. So gravity, you can ignore, because gravity needs much larger time scales to act over a certain distance because it's like 10 meter per second square. Okay? So over that uh, time duration, it will not be able to uh, get that kind of a length scale basically. So here are the uh, different spreading characteristics basically. So you have the different, um, like the beta is basically the spreading uh, rate of the droplet. 
for different surfaces, for example, for, for, and we are able to understand different mechanisms. So this is, for example, on glass, actually. And th this is on PDMS. And these two are for the one is for the PD rows and one is for the lotus, actually. And you can see there is a clear distinct of the how the, it's peaking. And again, it's falling. So it is going towards more harmonic trend, actually, for the later two cases. On the other hand, a more dissipative kind of trend for the glass and the PDMS kind of thing. So nobody did this. Like for. Natural experiment. Correct. Like, he, he, here, what we are trying to understand is we are trying to motivate the importance of that air layer actually that we did. Right. So that air layer measurements actually are not that uh, there in the literature. These kind of drop impact studies like these beta measurements, these are there in the community actually. Beta, beta is basically the maximum spread rate, the ratio of the, the maximum spread rate to the initial the drops. No, the maximum spread that it can, the length spread, scale. The length. Length. Okay. length divided by the original length. That's the beta basically. Okay. So again, like uh, what we are trying to understand, like motivate here is basically the reasons why we want to study these systems and the role of air actually, that is there actually. And that is the key thing that we will be covering here, the role of air layer in drop impacts. And that is the key part of the uh, uh, talk. Okay. So uh, as I said before, like th this is the jetting mechanism that we had actually, and this is again related to the naturally to the air crater lens scales, basically. This is uh, well understood in the community. And uh, and this was a very interesting thing that we saw, like, for example, at different ranges of Weber number settings, for example, you see at the lower parts, the mode of breakup and this, which is at a low, low Weber number, the, the modes of daughter, like droplet breakups are reversed. As you can see here, like here, the base length is larger here, the base, like the drop generated is smaller. On the other hand, for the top, it is other way. So that is very important engineeringly because you want to control, okay, what is the amount of drop that is coming from a given surface? And that could- I just saw this picture A and B. Yes. I would have said that uh, the second one is a liquid and the first one is gas bubbles. Yeah, but both are drops actually. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So like, whereas the first one looks like these bubbles in nucleic coil. Correct, correct. But it doesn't it look like a, like absolutely. It doesn't look like a ligament breakup can happen at these scales. Yeah. So this is not like the traditional, I will say, so here, if you talk about the, uh, the, the plateral relo criteria, that is not being satisfied for the top case, actually, for this kind of pinch off kind of breakup modes, actually. But still this breaks up, actually, because this is related to the kinetic energy the system has while it uh, receives back, actually. And this, this mechanism can be understood and the corresponding lengths can be uh, cl classified based on the corresponding uh, mass conservation and surface energy minimization, basically. So based on that, we can come up with uh, scales that can so explain this. See when we boil water, for example. Yes, yeah, like, like the, the nuclear boiling that you're talking nuclear about. Boiling. Yeah. Especially like if I take a spoon and I scratch the bottom of the button, uh -huh. I'll get a line of these uh, small things. Which will then Block, like uh, that and come it comes to bubbles in terms of basically yeah. correct. And the more hydrophobic I make it, the more like correct. The, the more hydro and and, like, and this depends critically on the impact kinetic energy basically. Yeah. So because that will tell how much it needs to go off the surface. So that was the bulb. So the key again, what I'm trying to uh, harp is basically the air layer that is between the drop and the substrate. It's, so it's skating on that, and that uh, you can see here the length scales basically we are talking about. So for example, this is an image for uh, Lotus actually. So this is roughly 14.6 to 15 microns in the pillar height basically. And this is roughly rows that is roughly of the order of five microns. This, this dimension is roughly five microns. So a row surface is very well packed and compact comparative to let's say a Lotus surface, which is very, very sparsely uh, placed basically. So that means, there is more chances of air being trapped in a lotus leaf than in a rose petal, basically. Hence, lotus leaf is very, very highly super hydrophobic surfaces, basically. And that is very important, actually, to understand this. So this like, clearly motivates the reason to study, basically, the air layer dynamics that occurs between drop and the corresponding uh, sub. So like, the, the corresponding problem that we want to understand, really, is basically that, that initial entrapment of that air and how that air drains out actually that is a key fluid mechanical problem that we are trying to target basically so so imagine you have a scenario in which like you have a drop and that drop is coming and impinging a substrate and we want to analyze what happens to the air that is there between the between the two actually and how that thing actually drains out for the corresponding mechanic that wetting to happen because 
uh, one thing is very natural. For example, if a solid body directly hits a substrate, the air automatically goes without any kind of deformation to the solid body because the solid body corresponding rigidity is very high and the moduluses are very, very high. On the other hand, for example, if you have a liquid drop, scenario is a little different because then what happens is we observe, all the intuition says that we will have a center contact, but the center, it doesn't happen like that. So what actually happens is because as the drop is coming down, what happens is there is an intense like pressure buildup. There is a lubrication pressure buildup at that region actually. And that is inversely proportional to the distance between the, uh, like the drop face, the forward face and the substrate. So as the drop is coming down, pressure is building up, building up, building up. And the moment it crosses the pressure jump at the interface of the droplet, the capillary pressure, two sigma by R, we start to see deformation at the bottom portion of the drop basically. And this prevents the very, very famous, like the contact uh, singularity problems that we know in fluid mechanics, correct? Like you take, okay, a solid body comes, it will take infinite time to contact the surface, correct? For drops, it is automatically prevented by the deformation of the surface basically, because the, the, the center part never contacts in the first place. What? Yeah. 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 So maybe like it's like, like what I will mainly highlight. Yeah. Like, but what I'm trying to tell is like I wanted to just motivate the main main aspect of the work, which was non-contact chronometer. I did that, and here the key motivation that I want to give is not the details, but more on the understanding of the air layer dynamics that is between the substrate. Okay, and that is a key thing I will uh, try to focus. So. This is the kind of the interferometry setup that we actually uh, developed and uh, to measure actually the corresponding, uh, the, the air layer thickness basically. So I will maybe fast forward a bit. So rather than, yeah, so what you can see is that these are the different components. So what you have here is the number 10 is a laser element basically. So there we have the source that is illuminating the entire thing and that depends on our control. So that we can choose different wavelengths and that sets our, both the spatial as well as the temporal resolutions of the measurement. So the smaller the wavelength, the better we can measure actually. But again, getting lasers at very, very low wavelengths is difficult. It's not easy. On the other hand, so what we did, our, our measurements were on the order of 532. So green to red, 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 red range, which is roughly out of the 630 nanometers roughly scale. So that was the upper limit of the lambda that we had. So what happens is this, uh, like you will see when the drop is coming, as you can see, the drop is coming down, the laser comes and interacts with the drop and you have a double reflection at the top and the bottom surface and that creates the corresponding. So you think this basically, so you have this double reflection and that is what we are able to measure. So, and th that, that is the key information. That is the key, I will say the information that we need to decode to get the corresponding thickness information. So yeah, we were trying our best to get these in the ring. Uh, one of the earlier students had been trying, and in Amherst he managed to get it. Okay. So that way we can measure the distance very accurately. Distance as well as the air layer here, for example. So what here we are measuring is these are directly correlated to the corresponding air layer thicknesses, basically, because what enters into that refractive index relation is basically the optical path length. So you have the refractive index multiplied by the optical path length. And that is related to the corresponding phase measurements and the intensity measurements. So if we measure that, we are able to measure the thickness basically. So another important point I just want to hi highlight is that you see the drop is normal impact, but you see the wetting, wetting that is happening. The first point of contact is side. So intuition doesn't say that like, it, so we have a normal impact that will, will happen, but it is being prevented by that local lubrication pressure that is being built up actually. And the contact happens at the side always. That's interesting. But then why do you get axisymmetric neutron rings? It should not be axisymmetric. So axisymmetric neutron rings basically the, because the pressure buildup is axisymmetric initially. The initial pressure that builds up when the drop is coming. And so that pressure buildup is very axisymmetric. But what leads to these whole formations, those are not in the classical hydrodynamics, I will say, lens scales. Those so these processes are actually occurring at length scales of the mean free path of the air molecules, actually. So that is the next part of the talk that I want to mainly focus on that. That is the different scales that we want to worry about, actually. So uh, like a normal drop impact problem basically is not just in the classical hydrodynamic length scales, but it goes right up to the mean free molecular path length scales, basically, where we, if we really want to understand what is happening at these length scales, like it cannot be understood based on normal. So Knudsen number becomes very, very important parameter in these kind of studies. Hence. 
So this I will. So this is basically the. So what we do is basically measure this i x1 x2, and hence the corresponding phase. And from the phase, we get the corresponding thicknesses basically. Okay. So th these are the lubrication analysis. I will skip over this. I will. Uh, go to the importance. So th this is the axisymmetric pressure that you are talking about. Like why this is axisymmetric because the the initial drop geometry is axisymmetric, and hence the pressure buildup is very very axisymmetric basically. That leads to a deformation. Actually measure the distance between the drop and the yield. Correct. If there's one funny point of contact. Yeah, yeah, but that occurs later. So what we are seeing is the initial. This is the initial. This is before uh, the deformation even started. So it's approaching. So now the delta P has not yet reached and crossed the capillary pressure. Once that thing happens, so we'll go. So now you see these things that start. So we have initially, let's say, a positive curvature, and then suddenly it shifts to a negative curvature. So this occurs over a time scale, basically, as you can see. It's like three in this scale. So this is non-dimensional. So this is roughly of the order you can say uh, of, of the order of microseconds, basically. Okay. So over let's say three microseconds, or actually in this case it's actually ten microseconds. So thirty microseconds, there is a change in curvature of the drop actually. So from being let's say concave up to being opposite, basically. And this is happening at the center. And this was understood in the last five to ten years by the interferometric community in drop impacts actually. What was our major contribution was on the outside part, which was not done before actually. So that is what we call. So again, like I'll just show a couple of images like here. So this is you can think about. You have a substrate and you have a drop impact, and you are seeing a bottom view visualization. And uh, we'll just skip it. Like you can see, like how that thing, that the contact point spreads, and that leads to an air entrapment and a bubble formation right at the center, basically. So that's for low temperature. And let's say if you increase the substrate temperature a little bit. We see a corresponding delay. You will just see this. Okay. So, like here, for example, if you see this is a little bit high, high temperature, and you see the contact point is still not there. It, it has expanded much further, 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 and now you see a contact point. But still, it happens in that peripheral disk region. And the interesting thing that we are trying to understand is, you see, this structure is not smooth and clear. There are perturbations on that disk actually. And we were able to first measure those things. Actually, what were those length scales over that which the perturbation happens, and correlate hence to those corresponding uh, uh, the first part points of contact, basically. So I will skip over these now because uh, so yeah, this is the, the important thing that I was talking about. So this is basically what you see is a Knudsen number map, basically, as the drop is coming down, basically. So what you see is the air layer thickness represented in terms of Knudsen number, and you see initially here the Knudsen number is very very well spread and nice. Very very symmetric, but just before the contact, you see there is a ring around where we see some weird stuffs happening. So we pick up some signals here, as you can see, and this is the line over which the contact happens. So if you think about that, this happens like there is a entire ring around which the contact probability becomes very very large because there the Knudsen number is climbing up very very fast basically, and this happens for all yeah. yeah like for different ranges of thicknesses basically. So, for example, here you see, like again, the temperature is raised, and you see that the thing is being delayed. The spot is being delayed. The first, uh, the contact point is being delayed. But again, you see, before that contact point, initially that it was very, very smooth and symmetric. But now you see, again, we are having these weird structures forming, basically, and that is a clear signal, basically, that there are some structural length scales that are being developed at that peripheral region, and there is what the first, where the first point of contact occurs. That was again. And this is for a much larger temperature regime, and you can see clearly, like uh, this, the thickness of this regime you see is a function of temperature. Actually, like if you see before here, this was very very thin. This was very very. This is like room temperature. You can think cold surface. On the other hand, as you increase the thickness, you see this is becoming larger and larger. For a little bit more, we have more large. If you cross the if you go towards the light and frost regime, we don't have these contacts. So we totally suppress this contact basically because now nowhere. Uh, it will not allow the thickness to go there because you have phase change at that rate. Okay, so this is again the th corresponding thickness thickness measurements that are there basically, and you can see that for uh, again it is a. 
like like yeah for those are like it depends on actually the material on which you are drop the doing the impact like it it is a substrate like dependent the, yeah, yeah yeah the flame is at 1000 degrees or something correct correct so yeah this can easily be 500 like for glass glass things and for let's say quartz that we do roughly 390 to 400 degrees celsius that's in kelvin but uh, this could be 500 degree right uh, yeah. those are things. correct so obviously nothing will happen Uh, for there like if we have very very high so you prevent it but what i'm trying to tell is like for actual drop impact scenarios let's say in inject printing it's not hot correct so these kind of bubbles form and that's why you have printing defects basically forming in different things and the important thing to realize is, is the formation of these structures and we don't understand really why this happens but the, our current our current measurements reveal that these occurs at length scales where the perturbation length scales lies at the balance between disjoining pressure and the capillary pressure head so the capillary pressure that is building up across the interface of the droplet that's a pressure scale being set at the air layer and when that meets the corresponding disjoint pressure at that there is where the corresponding thickness variations in the perturbations lie disjoint pressure protects so so like if you think like uh, so if you have a let's say a large system let's say and you take a pressure measurement anywhere correct like it it will measure as some kind of an um, i will say isotropic pressure measurements like like pressure we think is isotropic correct but let's say if we go to smaller and smaller length scales basically what happens is uh, due to less and less number of averaging i will say over a small uh, volume what is happening is we are losing this axisymmetric property or i will say isotropic properties actually so maybe the isotropic exists in two dimension but we are losing it in the third dimension and hence the point of contact where that happens we don't have the same pressure as we have a planar pressure field actually so the measurement that the ratio of that is what is related to by that uh, hammerkers constant basically and that a that you see basically that a over the hammerkers constant i don't know something stopped working Disjoining is the difference between the horizontal and the vertical pressure drop. Like, 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 you can think in terms of like, uh, uh, like, like as the thickness is coming, becoming smaller and smaller. Basically, you have a pressure up in scale. Basically, so there is a pressure that is increasing above your normal isotropic pressure that is acting. Actually, so you have a reference uh, reference uh, pressure that is there. Yeah, the screen sharing is off. We're trying to get it back. Samriti, can you hear us? Oh, I don't know. Suddenly, something happened. Okay, you can hear. There's no control from here. This laptop. I think so. That something happened suddenly. Okay. I was sharing screen. Sorry, and, uh, What did you press share screen again? No, no, no. Like I lose. Yeah. Shall I restart it once? Like if it's possible. The, the meeting is. Uh, uh, it's it's meeting is alive, correct? Is the socket working? By the way, like, can you check just check this one? Could I think that that is what was the issue? Maybe the. Yep. The charge was down. I see. Yeah.
can we hear the meeting any any questions anybody have uh, i don't know whether we'll be able to hear them yeah okay people are able to hear yeah. you okay did you also saw that the battery was about to die mm -hmm. What time do we have now? I think so. More fifteen minutes, right? Four o'clock yeah. till till four. Fifteen minutes. Yeah, just two minutes. is actually to hold that sound. Passport is a so this is a meeting join yeah. join just yeah zero eight zero zero eight zero nine two four nine two four okay okay wait 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 nine four three nine four three four one one four four one one four Seven seven five one. Yeah, this zero one. Zero, zero, two zero zero two zero two zero three two zero three. Two zero three. I should leave it. Got it correct? Yes. All right. And my computer audio? No, not required. Okay, I'll just share my screen. That's it. Open this. This is not Continue. Just confirm it. So uh, here, where I was actually like uh, we were discussing the interactions and the perturbations that we picked up actually at that peripheral disk and that occurred at the interface of uh, the capillary pressure and the disjoining pressure. And the measurements that we, we picked up was actually at that transition uh, Knudsen number regime, basically, as you can see, where your classical concepts of pressure are no longer true in that lens scale, basically. So that's why the key 
I, it's the key idea that we wanted to move on. And uh, th this is a like work related in which you are doing drop impacts on liquids basically. And we wanted to understand this, but I will not focus mainly on this due to time, time issues. I'll just move on and directly go to the other part, which is uh, this one actually. So again, you think that we have similar scenarios where you have a drop and that drop is impinging on a liquid and we still want to understand how that air layer that is there. And we want to resolve that actually. Okay, and and this like this is a uh, like bottom view imaging that I want to show where you see what we are seeing is how the rupture points we are picking up uh, that leads to a bubble formation actually, and this is you think about a liquid water drop impacting a silicon pole of viscosity five centistroke actually, and we played with the viscosity of the pool actually, and we found different regimes because the thicknesses were a function of actually the the earlier thickness was a function of the actual viscosity of the material. So this is a, it's a pool viscosity of 950 centistroke. And you see in this case, we have a lot more like different kind of structures that are forming basically. And as you can see, this is not, and you see the thing is delayed quite a bit. You don't see any hole. So this is just like a, we have entered the Leiden frost regime, but not in a, in a isothermal setting basically. So still the, the drop is expanding, but still there is no contact between the drop and the substrate basically. Still it is floating on air actually. And this happens and you see this weird, structures that is again coming into the picture, these lens scales, like these lens, and, and, and you see then a sudden rupture point happens and that rupture point leads again to that, that hole formations basically. Again, and these measurements also clarify the same thing that we discussed last time, that it occurs again at the balance of the scales that uh, between the capillary and the disjoining pressure scales. So um, the problem that we are trying to understand again is the drop impact and when it's coming, what happens to that silicon pool and we wanted to understand the corresponding dynamics. This is again, the scalings that we, we, we found out and the scalings comes from standard lubrication approximations basically. And the scaling for the spreading works with the lubrication very nicely. But what doesn't work is basically the predictions of, we are not able to predict where the rupture points are, where the thicknesses are going to what scale basically. So we are able to measure them, but we don't know what, how often they will come or when they will come. That is not under our control yet. So we want to do more of that research actually. That is what we want to understand. And we also found out a very unique instability. And this was the first one of the diagrams that I showed you basically. What is happening is due to this air that is being entrapped and how it interacts between, let's say you have an under, so this doesn't happen for let's say a solid, but it can happen for a liquid. So you have, let's say you think you have three liquids, you have a drop, you have an air in between and you have another liquid in bottom. So you think it's a, like a bubble system basically. So the bottom one is an actual picture, the above two are the schematics. So what you're seeing is basically the drop uh, impinging basically and the air trying to drain out basically. And during, while it tries to drain out, it forms this weird structures, weird shapes and structures actually. And this is basically a uh, draining. So what, what happens is when... Very, very viscous. Yes. But, but we tune the viscosity actually, like for yeah, different, yeah. Very it's very, correct, correct, correct. So, like, if I was a top fluid, oh, it's more surface tension. So, how is the relative surface tension to air? So, so, that, so, this is like, for example, silicon oil, the surface tension is about three times lower than air water actually. That's why this is happening. Okay, got it. So, like, uh, if you think like this, the A, so in principle, these kind of things can also happen at the top interface of this, but we are not seeing the top interface disturbed because of the higher surface tension of water actually. Since the surface tension of the bottom is lower compared to water, we see these kind of perturbations. And what is happening is this air layer trying to, and this air is entrapped. So this is not an open air actually. This air is entrapped and is trying to forcefully go and feed into this viscous medium and see this kind of whiskering safman taylor kind of patterns basically. So th that was a signature, again, we picked up and we did the experiments for different viscosities, you see, and the measurements fall right on spot. So this is, you see that this is the thin film uh, and the safman taylor instability lens scales. And you see the mean of the measurements and the corresponding scales that we obtained were exactly where we uh, uh, got for the corresponding viscosity fluids basically that we were playing actually. So that's the major uh, highlights I want to focus on. I think so, like, uh, like that was a key part of this event in which we wanted to mainly understand two things. 
One was basically non-contact tonometry. Why is it important? And the second part was the role of air layer in drop impacts, basically, and why more research is needed, specifically to understand early time dynamics, basically, very, very early time dynamics of the draining physics that occurs when the first point of contact happens. So, yeah, that's it, I think. So. Thank you. Any questions, anybody? Uh, drop falling on another layer, uh, another layer of. Another, so, for example, rain drop on an ocean surface. The water. Yeah, but let's say you have an oil spill. So, like, like so you have big oil reservoirs and correct, and then so like this oil oil tankers are leaking, and you have rain drops impacting on surfaces basically. Hmm. Yeah. So, so there are two important aspects here. One is uh, the pressure is related to the velocity, actually, the Weber number hence. And but the, another important parameter is the size of the drop because that also relates to the capillary pressure. So it's a balance between think about like two sigma over r. That's one term, and then you have some kind of uh, one over thickness square term, basically trying to balance. And that that is the lubrication pressure, basically. Like you have a one over thickness square. That is trying to balance the two sigma over r capillary jump pressure basically across the drop interface. So the both the speed is important. There would be a point of so so the, so the important thing to realize here is as since the thickness is in the denominator, correct? There will always be a Weber, uh, will always be a pressure. Well, it will cross the critical pressure if your delta p is significant in the experimental regime, basically, because it climbs very fast. It's square, basically, correct? Right? So it's climb. The pressure climbs up. It, it climbs up. It's not one over h. Let's say it's one over h square. Actually, that's it. So hence the pressure. It, it reaches that pressure very, very fast, actually. And hence, for almost all drop impact scenarios, you see this dimple to be forming. But like another thing, I just mentioned that you have that capillary pressure which is two sigma by r, correct? So let's say for smaller droplets, this effect will not be that pronounced. Because then what is your happening is you're, you're, you're also increasing the capillary pressure, basically. So for large droplets, the deformation will be large. But for small droplets, you will have more uh, rigid body kind of. So if you have very, very small droplets, very, very tiny, of the order of, let's say, micron, they will not deform as much as, let's say, if you have large droplets. They will have more deformation. Because the corresponding capillary pressure across the interface is related to the size of the drop, basically. Yeah, so so if you see overall from the center, you have the dimple, and the dim uh, surrounding the dimple, you have the disc basically. Okay, so that, and yeah, so so the layer is not flat. That's the first thing. Okay, there's a distribution. There is a distribution, and yeah. But still, the pressure development is accessible. The initial pressure development is axisymmetric. The initial, before the deformation takes place. The, the initial, that leads to the deformation. The initial is axisymmetric. But once the deformation starts to happen, and we have this, uh, I will say, these structures, as you can see, these structures that are forming, correct? These structures doesn't form initially, correct? So you think this drop, is, the drop wants to spread out, correct? It wants to spread out. So initially, the drop size was very small, very, very small, correct? So then in that case, basically, this disk was not that well, it didn't have that much dimensions in the first place. So up to that length scale, the pressure is axisymmetric. But once it crosses, then it's not axisymmetric anymore. Right? Axisymmetric. Can you make this uh, sample in lab? Yes. Try to mimic the uh, pressure of the layers in Yes, like like for for example, the the actual stamp that we create that's been taken actual from actual lotus leaf and actual rose. Yeah, like what I'm what I'm trying to tell is you can create similar structures also in lab. So rather than using an actual stamp, you can use the leaf itself as a mold, because if you observe a lotus or a, it's a rose, 
it's not smooth you can feel it on by your hand also and if you have a sufficiently soft surface you can Im imprint a uh, i'll say a copy of that on top of that surface it's like a uh, making a mold basically some kind of mold you have a negative and you have a positive mold. anything else anybody Can we hear it? How do you measure the air pressure between the drop? Uh, how do you measure the air pressure between the drop and the contact surface? Using the laser? Yeah. Using the laser, the measured distance. Yes. So to answer that, like what I'll suggest is understand how the pressure scales basically. Yeah. So you see this one, this thing basically. So this is basically the pressure distribution, the radial pressure distribution, as you can see. And that is being correlated to the corresponding thickness. Of, and for example, let's say if we have a very, very symmetric quadratic profile, one over R square profile, we have a corresponding pressure, basically. So there is a map between the corresponding pressure and the corresponding thickness, basically. So we can, based on that mapping, we are able to uh, get the corresponding ratios, basically. So, so what I'm trying to tell you, given that you have an H, you can calculate a P uh, so using the lubrication theory that we have. Using the lub lubrication approximation, yeah. Related to that, yeah, yeah. So, what is the uh, what is the general thickness of that air? Uh, so, it varies, as I said. At the center is roughly of the order of five microns. As you go towards the periphery and go towards the edge. It goes towards the mean free path of the air, basically. Ah, so that is why I because you mentioned yeah. yes. yes. So like at that, if you are reaching the levels of the mean free path, yeah. Then whatever continuum theory. Correct. Use, correct. Exactly. Like correct. Exactly. Correct. Exactly. That is the thing. That, that is the challenge that we are having. So this continuum theory works for the central dimple, but it doesn't work for the disc. That is the that is the thing that we are trying to understand, and that is the measurements that we are taking, basically to understand the connection basically to establish what should be the corresponding pressures on that disk region. But then in that case, you can do some kind of molecular dynamic simulation. For exactly, exactly, exactly. So, so we have to have a coupling between, let's say, molecular dynamics uh, in which surface tension is a key important parameter to be taken into account and the corresponding like, flow. You cannot forget the flow because it's an expanding flow problem. It's not a confined uh, uh, MD simulation, let's say, in a box. Basically. Like, like, for example, for drop impacts, like, for example, this scenario, like, let's say, if we know, let's say, the if you're tweaking the surface in a manner, we're changing some kind of a macroscopic wettability characteristics, for example, contact angle. So you did something to it so that it has a significant effect to the contact angle. Okay. In that sense, we are able to then correlate basically. So, for example, for the lotus and the rose, what we did was those surface topological uh, mapping that we did actually that has a direct consequences to the corresponding apparent contact angle basically that the drop creates when it rests on a surface and hence we know okay we have created a surface that is super hydrophobic let's say or hydrophobic or let's say hydrophilic because that is the macroscopic parameter that is telling us what a surface is like how wettable it is basically. 
like uh, like currently like because for our experiments we are using the contact angle as the parameter to understand the vetability characteristics that is one of the major parameter i will say but uh, apart from that we are not yet looked into any other i will say parameters that has a direct role uh, in let's say this uh, topology basically and then one nice question about the about the filter pressure ah, yeah pressure is due to the difference between inflow and outflow correct 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 but having nice question to maintain the inflow it gives other pressure mechanisms yes so like like what happens is like um, so in biological systems what happens is you have these cells correct and these cells always creates some kind of a substance out of that it's some let's say some enzyme sometimes it can be depending on different parts of our so let's say for our eye it so that ciliary body they are the source of that aqueous humor fluid basically it constantly secreting that so there is a certain flow rate to that so it's roughly 5 microliters per minute okay some of that range and then you have a certain drainage rate that goes out of the sclem canal so for a given individual whose eye is very very working properly its iop measurements typical iop measurements are within from 13 i will say from 12 to 15 uh, mm of mercury the 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 gauge pressure if that is that is considered healthy if you cross more than 19 you are glaucoma like your pressure is so high that can lead to damage in your nerve optical nerves basically and it can lead to blindness basically so you see how this thing builds up it builds up either you block the outflow or you create somehow a condition in your body you have more inflow the more the secretion so you can have two kind of conditions basically in thing either in which you are blocking most cases it is the blocking thing that ha- happens for most patients actually so for them uh, their blocking mechanism like it blocks and sufficiently not able to drain out properly the things and this aqueous humor is a fluid actually which uh, so when it drains out from that sclem canal it, it actually merges into the art actually the veins of our body actually and it goes to the through the our jugular vein it goes to our heart actually so it, so it's a like it's a complex multi i'll say scale process it's not like okay there is a distinction between aqueous humor is very uh, i will say water like fluid okay and you know our human blood has this blood plasma with this blood plasma being the major i will say 50% component of our body so any kind of uh, aqueous humor that enters there are mechanism that it can go into our uh, blood capillaries basically our blood veins so yeah yes initial yes the initial pressure calculations when we so what we are then it will change it will change so even in the continuum yes even in the obviously yeah keeping the pressure giving it is the structure of the cell no if it is sufficient so that you have an obstruction towards its approach length scale like how it is approaching okay then it will affect on the other hand let's say if it is in a length scale regime where the approach mechanism is not being prevented okay so it's at a length so what is actually important is not the drop length scale but the topology length scale measured as a ratio of the air layer length scale you see the distance between the leading edge of the drop and the substrate that is the important length scale to be worried about so that's that uh, so in this lubrication analysis you have that epsilon parameter that sits actually that epsilon parameter is actually measuring that thickness the central thickness between the drop and the substrate and the drop radius basically so let's say if you have some kind of a topology variation that epsilon is what gets affected basically because then epsilon is not a constant number that you can put in the model but it's a field basically at different points you have different uh, things basically and there is a qualitative difference there is a qualitative and, and for example like let's say if you have different uh, uh, epsilon values are different things now your corresponding pressure build up will be different it will not be monotonic like this for example here we are seeing a monotonic hence a very very concentric newton ring because the pressure build up is very monotonic very high pressure at the center as you go out there is a low pressure and hence you have this uh, formation but let's say you have a um, formation which is a hill valley hill valley so at some pressure it can be high pressure so then you will have non monotonic newton rings basically and that can be picked up by the interferometer experiment so what we will see is we will not see circular rings we will see deformed fringes basically 
and from there to them also we will be able to calculate the corresponding uh, real time thickness information on okay. actually happens always always happens this is I, I was always curious by this thing actually by like whenever i used to do this um, problem like uh, uh, like let's say you have a drop and you want to study the drop evaporation and let's say drop impacts i used always to want to observe this experiments there used to be always when i zoom in and see it from the side view no i always used to see some kind of a bubble that was entrapped inside always i used to see this and i could never understand the main reason that why this was happening actually unless i found out this mechanism or oh, this is actually the mechanism so you saw that air layer entrapment correct that how that central disk leads to that air layer entrapment so you have a very very uniform and then you have an axisymmetric spots like uh, for example like here you can see this maybe like uh, so you see this 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 so you see that these are different spots basically where you have different pressure values actually because here now the pressure is not monotonic anyway because the the first point of contact the first point of contact by definition is a place where there is no molecules anymore so there the existence of hydrodynamic continuum pressure itself is not valid because that's the point when there is no air molecules anyway because so yeah if you are very very confined region very very near to the contact point there we are working in which in the planar two dimensional uh, direction the isotropic holds but in the vertical direction the isotropic of pressure we lose because we don't have sufficient molecules in that dimension basically so the trial is to study smooth which one so so this same thing we also see in liquids and li so this doubt we had before okay let's say why can this not happen due to some kind of an irregularities in the surface correct but then we also saw okay if you try in liquids in liquids the mean free path is of the order of angstroms and nanometers basically for gases is of the order of 80 uh, i will say roughly 80 microns no roughly 80 nanometers sorry it is roughly 80 nanometers 80 to 90 nanometers on the other hand for liquids it is actually two orders lower actually but for liquids also we did a similar experiment we see similar whole positions so there is no chance like in terms of okay where this thickness is going down so the, so what is happening is there also the air layer what has been present there basically like it's so the the formation of those spots is basically due to some kind of a structure that is present in that disk region actually 